So welcome back to everyone. Welcome to SEI 154. So from next week, everything will be back to normal and I will also be on campus. So I started, I fought for today's lecture to start out with. Do you guys know about some useful tools in astronomy that you can use, especially from people coming from a computer science background? You guys have any idea of what software you can use? So a piece of software that you can use that will also assist you with your moon assignment is Stellarium. Have you guys heard about Stellarium or used Stellarium before? Okay, one person, anyone else? Okay, so if you Google Stellarium, you get to its page, you can download it for whatever operating system you're using, Linux, Mac, Windows, and then you can download Stellarium and it's really useful. So I think I'm going to show you guys a short demonstration on Stellarium. Let me just open up Stellarium on my side. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. So with Stellarium, it makes use of, if you connect it to the internet, it makes use of your current time and location. So here it is. But you can change it. So let's put off the, so uh, you want to show this, want to have that on. So right now, currently, we can see it is daytime. So what we want to do is we want to turn off our uh, central point atmosphere. So here we can see where stars and objects is. So if we go west, here we can see Mars, Venus, Saturn, the sun. And if you click on it, you can get more information on it as well. So these dots are um, also other planetary systems. Here is formaldehyde. So let's do this. Let's turn off exoplanets for now. So here we can see where everything is. So we can also determine. So here's Jupiter's up. There's Aldebaran, Betelgeuse. So this is the Orion Nebula. So according to this, the moon has not risen yet. So we can use this. So if you click on settings as well and you have telescopes, you can select your eyepieces, your, your lenses, your sensors, what telescope you are using. And you can use this to determine where the moon is and where the moon will be. So this is actually very cool software to use. Do you guys have any questions, anything else in the software you would like to see or know about? Is everyone happy? Awesome. So let's get back to our slides. So that was Stellarium. Do you guys know this little mascot?
Yes, that is Linux. Who of you has used Linux before? That's good to hear. Anyone else? So when we look at our three major operating systems, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, it all, all depends on what your application is and what your scenario is. Each, each piece of operating system is unique and is suited for different things. So if you play games, then the only operating system you can basically use is Windows. But for the stuff I'm doing, Windows is too unstable. So I haven't used Windows since 2014. So since then, I've always been using a Mac. And when I do really computational stuff and really things that need stability, I have a few Linux servers that I use. So majority of servers across the world uses Linux. The majority of the scientific community uses Linux. So for example, at the RTBS Duke Radio Astronomy Observatory, Adral, everything runs on Linux. Meerkat runs on Linux. The Green Bank Observatory runs on Linux. Salt runs on Linux. So with Linux, there's a few distributions that you can use and make use of. So I usually prefer using um, Ubuntu or Debian. Uh, Ubuntu is just a derivative from Debian and Pop! OS is also very good. What distros have you guys used or played around with? Ubuntu. Yes, Ubuntu is very user friendly. So if anyone wants to start playing around with operating uh, with Linux, Kali is also very good. I would recommend starting out with Ubuntu. And then CERN. Are you all familiar with CERN and the Large Hadron Collider? So they have developed their own Linux distro called Scientific Linux that you can download and install and use as well. And have any one of you played around with virtualization or virtualization software? So which virtualization software do you make use of? VMbox? No, VirtualBox. So yes, so the three most popular ones probably VirtualBox and Oracle, VMware and KBM. So Fusion, yes, that's from VMware. So I'm usually making use of VMware Fusion and also KBM. So I have a Windows virtual machine that I fire up every now and then if I have to make use of software that's only available for Windows. And also when I play games, then I fire up a Windows VM. And what's awesome about the latest virtualization software is, especially when making use of KVM and VMware, you can have direct pass through to your hardware. That means there's no intermedi intermediate layers. That means there's no performance sacrifices because your operating system in your virtual environment has direct access to the hardware, making it very easy to use. So if you want to uh, get used to it, then you can or want to get into Linux, then you can start using VMware. So if you have played around with the terminal in Ubuntu. So let me quickly give you a quick overview of how that would look like. Let me share my application. Uh, let me share this. Can everyone see my terminal screen? So this is a server sitting at the observatory. So you can say ls, that links you know, your home directory. You can use glances, for example. 
that will show you what's happening, what processes are running. Uh, we can do HTOP, for example. It shows you what the different CPU cores and memory is doing. Or you can literally, so let's go to CD document, the documents directory. So this is how you would work. So you can do it graphically or via terminal. So if you are a pro Linux user, you rarely use the graphical user interface because everything is just much easier making use of the terminal. Let's go back to that slides. So that is just a bit of Ubuntu. So one thing that you realize in my classes is I'll do a lot of Windows bashing. And hopefully this will open your eyes to a bit of different operating systems as well. And it's like the creator of Linux said, uh, Linux revolts. A computer is like air conditioning. It becomes useless when you open windows. Do you guys have any questions about the software packages? Okay, so let's go to where we stopped last week. Let me get that slide. Have any one of you started with your moon assignment or not yet? Planning on researching, nothing concrete. Okay, so I've now you guys will figure out the correct day for this. So last week we ended off with this character, Galileo Galilei. So most people think they know two facts about Galileo, but both facts are wrong. They are common misconceptions. You've probably heard them. So Galileo did not invent the telescope and he was not condemned by the Inquisition for believing the Earth moved around the sun. Then why is Galileo so famous? Why did the Vatican reopen his case in 1979, almost 400 years after his trial? As you learn about Galileo, you will discover that his trial concerned not just, place, not just the place of Earth and the motion of the planets, but also a new and powerful method of understanding nature, a method called science. So is the semester our semester test too? So yes, the assignment counts the same weight as the semester test. So yes, you can basically think of it as a semester test too. The telescope was apparently invented around the year 1608 by lens makers in Holland. Galileo, hearing descriptions in the fall of 1609, was able to build telescopes in his workshop. In fact, Galileo was not the first person to look at a sky through a telescope, but he was the first person to apply telescopic observations to the theoretical problem of the day, the place of Earth. What Galileo saw through his telescopes was so amazing that he rushed a small book into print Sidorus Nucleus, or translated from Latin to English, the Starry Messenger. And he reported three major discoveries. First, the moon was not perfect. It had mountains and valleys on its surface. And Galileo even used some of the mountain shadows to calculate their height. Aristotle's philosophy held that the moon was perfect, 
But Galileo showed that it was not only imperfect, but was a world with features like Earth's. The second discovery reported in a book was that the Milky Way was made of a myriad of stars, too faint to see with the unaided eye. Well, intriguing, this could not match Galileo's third discovery. Galileo's telescope revealed four new planets circling Jupiter, objects known today as the Gillian moons of Jupiter. Uh, looks like I made a mistake here in the slides. Jupiter. So sometime after he published his book, Galileo noticed something else that made Jupiter's moons even stronger evidence for the Copernican model. When he measured the orbital periods of the four moons, he found that the innermost moved fastest and that the moons further from Jupiter moved proportionally slower. So Jupiter's moons made a ominous system ruled by Jupiter, just as the planets in the Copernican universe were a harmonious system ruled by the sun. The similarity isn't proof, but Galileo saw it as an arrangement or argument that a solar system is sun-centered rather than earth-centered. So a good question I usually ask sometime in the semester test and um, exam is what is from Galileo's greatest discoveries? So one thing that Galileo also discovered is sunspots. And we will learn about sunspots in great depth in a later chapter. But basically what sunspot is, is, uh, let me first, before I explain what a sunspot is, um, that all of you have natural science as a subject in high school. So meaning physics and chemistry. Okay, so let's, uh, are you, let me ask, are you all familiar with magnetic field lines or how a magnet works? So let me quickly get to this to explain it a little bit better and that will help in later chapters as well. So if we think about a normal bar magnet, Here we have north, here we have south, then the magnetic field lines will look something like this. Are you guys familiar with this image? Awesome. So yes, so your magnetic field line goes from north to south and you've probably seen this somewhere in your schooling careers so a bit off topic do you guys know why at extreme north latitudes and extreme north uh, southern latitudes we have the aurora borealis lights So we have the aurora lights because our Earth works in the same thing. Our Earth's magnetic field also extends from the North Pole to the South Pole. But where Earth's magnetic field and a magnet's magnetic field is the weakest is this part over here. So this region over here and this region over here, high charged particles from the sun can enter Earth's atmosphere and interact with Earth's atmosphere to cause the Borealis light. So what we are seeing is actually high charged particles interacting with Earth's atmospheres uh, at these regions. And that is where the Aurora Borealis um, exists and we can see them. So let's go. Yes, that's correct. The name changes a bit from north to south. But in short, we can still know it as the Auroras. 
So yes, in the northern hemisphere, it's the Aurora Borealis, and in the southern hemisphere is the Aurora Australis. So let's go back to our lecture slides. So right here, we see sunspots. So what we can do with a sunspot is, so let me get something to draw out with. So we can divide the sun in a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. And in these sunspots always occurs in pairs. So if there's one sunspot in the northern hemisphere, the second sunspot will appear in the southern hemisphere. And what is happening between it, so let's make this easier. So let's say a sunspot appears here, then another sunspot will appear somewhere in the southern hemisphere. And what happens is that is actually a McNeil field line exiting the surface of the sun and then entering the surface of the sun, and that causes those two points or those two areas of the sun to be cooler than the rest of the surrounding surface. And because it's cooler, it creates these cooler dots. Are you guys happy with this explanation? Okay, so I'll repeat this, so let me clear this. So let me repeat this again. So if we divide the sun in a northern and a southern hemisphere, so they call this northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, sunspots appear always in pairs. So if one appears somewhere in the northern hemisphere, another one will appear in the southern hemisphere. And what's actually happening, that's magnetic field lines emanating from that position that emanates a U outside of the sun's surface and then enters the sun's surface again. And that is what causes a sunspot. So the spot right here is literally cooler than the rest of the surface of the sun. It's a pleasure. And Galileo was the first person to observe this. So never observe a, the sun directly through binoculars or a telescope. But if you point the telescope or binoculars to the sun and you keep a piece of paper where the eyepiece is, then that will create an image on a piece of paper and you can actually see the sunspots on that piece of paper without directly looking at the sun with your uh, own eyes, causing damage to your eyes. And he was the first person to observe them. Another thing that Galileo observed was that Venus had phases, just like the moon. Did you guys know Venus had phases? So depending where Venus is in its orbit around the sun, we will see its phases throughout the year. And this is just its own shadow we are seeing. So that was also quite an amazing discovery by Galileo. So what Galileo discovered is, as we have the sun-moon system, Venus acts directly the same. So if we are looking towards the sun, here's Venus. And if Venus goes around Earth, we won't see the phases. But if Venus travels around the sun, we will see Venus phases. So Galileo's telescope revealed such things as craters on the moon, phases of Venus, and the existence of four moons orbiting Jupiter. He demonstrated his telescope and discussing his observations with powerful people explained how observational evidence could be used to test the prevailing Earth-centered model of the universe. Some of the viewers thought that Galileo's telescope was the work of the devil and would deceive anyone who looked. Galileo's discoveries produced intense and, in some cases, an angry debate, and he was condemned by the Spanish position in 1633. 
So here in his book are some observations of the four moons, four of Jupiter's biggest moons orbiting it. So here you can see how the dates differ, how the positions of the moons around Jupiter also differ. So do you guys know who this person is? And who is this? Yes, this is Sir Isaac Newton. So what is Isaac Newton most famous for? So, yes, you can say gravity. So he's laws on gravity. And he also has his laws of motion. But there's one thing you guys are all are still missing. Uh, light as well from prism. Yes, calculus. So who of you have calculus as a module? So Isaac Newton developed calculus before the age of 25, if I'm correct. And he invented calculus to explain these different laws. Why do you say sadly and unfortunately? Why don't you guys like calculus? I know it's hard, but it is a beautiful module and it's the unique language the universe speaks. You guys will still get the hang of calculus. So in calculus, what are you guys doing? Are probably going to be limits now, or am I incorrect? Yep, I remember those limits back from my first year. That is a horrible part of the work. You're looking at functions in terms of sets. Yes, I can remember. One thing I can tell you, calculus will become more fun and better. So the problem of the place of Earth was resolved by the Copernican Revolution. But a problem of planetary motion was only partly solved by Kepler's laws. For the last 10 years of his life, Galileo studied the nature of motion, especially the accelerated motion of falling bodies. Although he made some important progress, he was not able to relate his discoveries about motion on Earth to that in the heavens. The final step fell to Isaac Newton. He made most of his discoveries in optics, mechanics, and mathematics. Among other things, he studied optics, developed three laws of motion, defined the nature of gravity, and invented calculus. The publication of his work in his book Principia in 1687 placed science on a firm analytical base. So this is the original book he created. So you can still buy copies of this book. You can also buy this book that's been translated from Latin to English. And something interesting, do you guys know who has a copy of his original book or where it currently sits? So this book, or the first book, is now currently part of Bill Gates' private collection. So Bill Gates has bought this book at an auction somewhere, and it's been now in his collection. And um, Leonardo da Vinci also had a book that he published, and the original book is also in Bill Gates' personal collection. That's just something interesting as a side note. So here is another image of his book and a, another one. So in this book is how he developed calculus, um, how he developed his laws of gravitation, how he developed his laws of motion, optics, and everything he developed is 
in this book in his own handwriting, which is astonishing. So here we can put together on a time scale where everyone we talked about in which time era they lived. So here we can see Copernicus at 1500, Galileo is 1600, here we can say Tycho Brahe, here we can say Luther, here's Michelangelo, here's Shakespeare, here's Newton, and here's George Washington, Napoleon, King George III, Benjamin Franklin, so you can see here is Bach, so every Mozart, so everything quite overlapped during this time. So this shaded area is probably one of the most important eras for science, more specifically for uh, astronomy. So here you can see as Elizabeth I, Guy Fawkes, Rembrandt, and I'm sure you've all recognized a few of these names. So I'm sure you, most of you are familiar with Newton's three laws of motion, correct? So this is another test, uh, another question I can ask in a test and exam. I could ask you to list Newton's three laws of motion. I can say, for example, what is his first law? I can ask you, for example, explain his second law. Everything in that context. And uh, no worries, McKay. So let me go through Newton's three laws. So the first law is a body continues at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by some force. So what that means is a good example of this is let's say we are traveling in a car and friction is something that does not exist. So we are at a constant speed, so that meaning we will continue on forever, but unfortunately due to friction, that's an external force that will slow the car down. But if there are no external force, then we have to apply the brakes. Then the brakes is an external force and that will slow us down. Or when we press the accelerator, that's an external force and that will make us accelerate and continue faster. But what it means is if something is moving at a constant speed, it will continue moving at a constant speed unless something acts on it. Or if something is at rest. So let's say, for example, you have a container on your desk. To move the container, you have to apply a external force. You guys happy with Newton's first law? Then a second law, the change of motion A of a body of mass M is proportional to force acting on it and in the direction of the force F equals MA. And then thirdly, when a body exerts a force on a second body, the second body exerts an equal and opposite force back on a first body. So when we explain this, this is an example of it. So if an object is at rest, it will stay at rest until a net force is acted on it. And then if an object is in motion, it will stay in motion unless a net force acts on it. The second law, F equals MA, is the more force, the more acceleration. And that force is only consists of the mass of the object and the acceleration of the object. So this, if the, the, the faster acceleration and the mass remains the same, the greater the force. And then lastly, every action has an equal opposite reaction. So that means if you are standing, so let's say you have a wall in between you, standing on a trolley. If you push against the wall, the wall will push back at the exact same force you are pushing onto it. So that is just a summary of it. And then Newton's law of, Newton's law of universal gravitation. That is the law of a universal gravitation states that every point mass attracts every other point mass in the universe by force pointing in a straight line between the centers of mass of both points. 
And this force is proportional to the masses of the object and inversely, inversely proportional to the separation. So in Sweden's short, what this means is one body in the universe will literally attract another body. So that is, for example, why we have tides on Earth that we will talk about in a later chapter in more detail. But we have tides because that's Earth, uh, the moon's um, the moon's gravitation pulling on Earth, so that means the moon's gravitation is pulling the water in our oceans towards it. And that is why we have uh, tides. And you can also use this as a pickup line. So if you ever pick up someone, you can walk to them and say, according to Newton's law of universal gravitation, one body will attract another body. So just a bit of science humor. Are you all happy with these explanations? Awesome. So the next thing we need to take a look at is orbital motion. So Newton's laws of motion and gravitation make it possible to understand why the moon orbits Earth and how the planets move along their orbits around the sun. And you can even discover why Kepler's laws work to understand how an object can orbit another object. It helps to describe the orbital motion as Newton did, as form as a form of falling. An object orbiting Earth is actually falling, being accelerated towards Earth's center. So the object continuously misses Earth because of its orbital velocity. To follow a circular orbit, the object must move with circular velocity vc. And at the right distance from Earth, it could be very useful to use synchronous satellites. So what this means is if we want to uh, figure out how orbits work, let's say we are above on the North Pole of Earth on our altitude and we have a cannon. Let's say we fire the cannon at a slow acceleration. That means it will go a bit and then fall to Earth because Earth's gravity is pulling it to the center of Earth. If we increase the acceleration, it will go a little bit farther. If we increase acceleration even more, it will fall around Earth. Because what's happening is Earth is moving to the right and this is also moving around Earth. If we fire even more faster, more acceleration, we have D, and if you fire ever greater, we have E. Do you guys happy with this explanation of orbital motion? So how fast would we have to fire that projectile to get it into orbit? So that depends on the weight of that projectile. So if, have you guys ever thought about orbital mechanics of what is required to get a spacecraft in orbit around Earth? So every object on Earth has an escape velocity. So that means when you use uh, look at Newton's laws, that's the force that object is being pulled to towards Earth. So your escape velocity needs to be greater than the gravitational pull of that object. So on Earth, we are being pulled towards Earth at 9.8 meters per second. That is the gravitational pull of Earth. So if we want to escape Earth's velocity or Earth's gravitational pull, our escape velocity has to be greater than 9.8 uh, kilometers per second. But we also have to consider the weight of the object being fired. So if we are want to leave Earth, go into orbit on Earth, you have to travel fast. If you want to go into a higher orbit, you increase your speed. If you want to go in a lower orbit, you increase your speed. So, who of you have watched SpaceX launches? Do 
So why in a SpaceX launch should I aim for a speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour? Because that is the escape velocity for that space vehicle. Have you guys realized that? Are you guys familiar with a geostationary orbit? So what in your everyday lives makes use of a geostationary orbit? Not Google Maps, not GPS, because those satellites orbit at low Earth orbits, not internet, some, uh, no, not internet, DSTV. So with your DSTV, your dish that you point outside, if the, if the satellite is in low Earth orbit, you have to continuously have to move your satellite to, to, um, or move your dish to track a satellite, but you always point your satellite dish in the same direction. So if you strip the geosynchronous orbit, you place your satellite very far from Earth so that your speed of Earth, so the, so the speed that your satellite orbits around Earth is the exact same speed that Earth rotates around its own axis. And this is roughly 36,000 kilometers above Earth's orbit. So to put this in perspective, the International Space Station is an altitude of 400 kilometers. The Starlink satellite is at a distance between 80 and 120 kilometers. Our normal communication satellite is about 200 kilometers. Our GPS satellite is between 200 and 600 kilometers. So this is our geosynchronous orbits. And that is for our geostation. Are you guys happy with this? Awesome. Uh, can you guys just quickly hold on for a second? Just have a Sorry about that. So when we are looking at orbital motion, so when we put this into perspective with this object right now, or this image, we can see to be accurate, you should not say that an object orbits Earth, but rather two objects orbit each other. And gravitation is mutual. And if Earth pulls on the moon, the moon pulls on Earth. And the two bodies revolve around the common center of mass, the balance point of the system. So for this example, let's have Earth, Moon as a system. So we really can't say, so we will be scientifically accurate. The Moon orbits Earth, yes, but the Moon doesn't exactly perfectly orbit Earth. So there's, if you look at a central mass, if you look at the two systems, you will have a central mass and the bigger or more heavier the object, the closer that point will be to the heavier object. So somewhere below Earth's surface is the central point where Earth rotates around and the moon rotates around. You guys happy with that explanation? So that means in every system, there will be a common point two objects will orbit around. So in our, our um, let's take our solar system, for example, when we take the sun and earth, 
the two are actually rotating around a central point, but that central point is below the surface of the sun. So that is why we are rotating around the sun. Does everyone understand that? Awesome. And this is how the orbit of our solar system works. So our sun is in the center and 99% of our mass of our solar system is contained in the sun. And each component, so the sun and Earth, sun and Venus, sun and Mars, each of them orbits a central point. And that central point falls below the surface of the sun. And that is where everything is rotating around the sun. Now, sir, can I please confirm you said Galileo's greatest discovery was sunspots, or one of his greatest discoveries was sunspots. So his greatest discoveries was sunspots. The moon had craters and mountains. He discovered the phases of Venus. He discovered that Jupiter has moons. He discovered sunspots. And he discovered when you look through a telescope in a night sky, you can see stars fainter. And that's not visible with the unaided eye. Does that answer your question? So an exam, if you ask one of his greatest discoveries, we can list any of the ones you mentioned. Yes, that's correct. So a tip. I usually ask to list four of his greatest discoveries. So he discovered sunspots. He discovered that a moon has valleys, craters, and mountains, so it's not perfect. He discovered that Venus has phases. He discovered that Jupiter has moons. And he also discovered if you look through a telescope in the night sky, you can see stars that's too faint to see with your unaided eye. You guys happy with that? Pleasure. So now we can talk about the difference between closed orbits and open orbits. So if you want to leave Earth and never return, you must give your spaceship escape velocity and that will be an open orbit. But if you remain around Earth, that is a closed orbit. So here, for example, is our canon example again. So if we are orbiting around Earth, that is a closed orbit, so we can put it in an ellipse, a circular orbit. But if we are moving away from Earth, we call that an open orbit. Do you all recognize this spaceship? And which spaceship is this? Yes, it's the USS Enterprise, more precisely the Enterprise D from Star Trek. So let's, for example, we imagine ourselves, we are currently on the Enterprise and we are approaching a planet and we want to go into an orbit. What do we do?
So yes, that is correct. So the first thing is, you get close enough to start falling, but still missing the planet. And then you increase or decrease your speed, depending on how high of orbit you want to be. So we can actually calculate what the speed needs to be. So we can call it the circular velocity. So the circular velocity is the velocity a satellite must have to remain in a circular orbit around a larger body. So if the mass of the satellite is small compared with the central body, then the circular velocity is Vc equals the square root of Gm over R, where G is the universal gravity constant, M is the mass of the object, and R is the distance from you to where the object is. So this formula, M is the mass of the central body in kilograms, R is the radius in orbital meters, and G is the gravitational constant. So this formula is all you need to calculate how fast an object must travel to stay in a circular ob orbit. So for example, how fast does the moon travel in its orbit? So the mass of Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the power 24 kilograms. And the moon orbits 3.84 times 10 to the power 8 meters from Earth's center. So the moon's velocity, as you plug that in, is 1,024 meters per second. So the circular shows, the calculation shows that the moon travels at 1.02 kilometers along its orbit each second. So no, this is not centripetal force, but it, they are related. So something that Earth, the Earth-Moon system also creates is tides. Have all of you observed the tides at the ocean? Okay, but have you guys heard about Earth tides as well? So as the moon influenced the tides, so it grabs and pulls the water closer to the moon, the same thing actually happens with the ground itself. So if it's high tide, we have measured it at uh, the observatory. If it's high tide, the ground literally lifts up between 27 and 33 centimeters. And if it's low tide, the ground literally gets pushed down between 27 and 33 centimeters. In, in city centers, that due to the big foundations of the building, that movement is a bit limited, but that's still between five, three and five centimeters. But on average, when it's high tide, the ground literally lifts up between 27 and 33 centimeters. And when it's low tide, it literally gets pushed down, but between 27 and 33 centimeters. Do you guys, did you guys realize that? So that is just something interesting with the Earth Moon system. And also remember that one body attracts literally another body. So how does this work is, so when you look at this image, we can see here that the lunar gravity acting on its oceans in the North Pole. So here we can see it's the North Pole, South Pole, here's the moon. So that causes water to be the Earth's oceans to bulge in these two directions. And we call that the tidal bulge. And what actually happening is Earth is rotating inside this tidal bulge. So when it's rotating through this part, it's high tide. When it's rotating through this part, it's low tide. And at this side and this side, it will be low tide. Do you guys understand how that works? Should I explain it again? Okay, so what's happening is, in, so let's say, for example, here's the Earth, here is the Moon. So the Moon pulls the water towards it. So it's because all the water on Earth can't be pulled to one side, it causes a bulge. If you think about a water balloon and you flatten it on the top side, that means it will bulge out in this direction. And it will bulge out in that direction. 
and we'll bulge out in that direction. Let's get a bit of color to draw with. And that's exactly what's happening uh, with this. So that means we have a bulge over here, a bulge over there. It's flat over here and flat over there. So as Earth rotates in this area, when this part rotates through this area, there's more water, so it's high tide. Then when it rotates around, coming to this side, it's low tide. And when it rotates through this area again, it rotates through bulge again, which is high tide. And when it rotates through this area again, it's low tide. Do you understand that? Does everyone understand this? Cool. So this is what causes tides. But there are two more tides we are missing. Which are those two tides? Not sun tides, but we can have the sun included, but spring tides and neap tides. So when we have spring tides, spring tides are extremely high tides. So that means we have, for example, let's get something to draw out. We have the sun over here. We have the moon over here and earth over here. So what that means is in the system, we have the sun pulling on the system as well. So that means we have extremely big tides here. So when it's high tide, they are on extreme, so extreme high tides. And when it's low tides, we have extreme low tides. And then we have neap tides. So that is when we have the sun over here. So let me draw it. We have the sun over here, and then the moon is over here. So the influence of these two systems now counteract one another, and then our tides are mild. Do you understand the difference between these two? Awesome. And that is tides. So the sun is roughly 27 miles a million times more massive than the moon, but it lies almost 400 times further from Earth. Consequently, tides on Earth causes, caused by the sun are less than half as high as those caused by the moon. Twice a month at new moon and at full moon, the moon and sun produce tidal bulges that add together and produce extreme tidal changes. High tides is very high and low tides is very low. Such tides are called spring tides. Yet the word spring does not refer to the season but the year, part of the year, but to the rapid welling of the water. At first and first quarter moons, the sun and moon pulls at right angles to each other and the sun's tide cancel out with the moon's tides. These lesser stream tides are called neap tides, and they do not rise very high or fall very low. The word neap comes from an obscure old English word nip, that means to have meant lacking power. So here we can see a bit bigger influence of IT's um, spring tide. So here is the sun, the moon, in extremely high tides and extremely low tides. So, astronomers built on the discoveries of Newton, just as he had built on the discoveries of Copernicus, Tycho, Kepler and Galileo. It is the nature of science to build on discoveries of the past and Newton was thinking of that when he wrote, I have seen further it by standing on the shoulders of giants. Do you guys also else know who have said the exact same quote? Any ideas? So, 
Albert Einstein said exactly the same quote as well. Because he built his work on the previous generation. Who else have said this quote? Stephen Hawking, and I'm sure you are all familiar with Stephen Hawking. And you know, in recent times, who have said this exact same quote as well? J. Robert Oppenheimer. And J. Robert Oppenheimer, after the first detonation of the first atomic bomb, he said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, because he built his work on the previous generations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was this set of lecture slides. Do you have any questions? Any questions? So while I'm uploading the next set of lecture slides, let's take a short, a short break. We will resume the class at 22.4. Uh, yes, I will give you a formula sheet. Uh, yes, when we return after our break, I'll show you a video on tides. So do we have to know the tides in detail? Yes, in exam or test, I can ask you what is a knee tide, what is a spring tide, or how does tides occur? Uh, yes, I can ask you, what is a geostationary orbit? If you um, if I ask you what is geosynchronous orbit, that means the orbit at which or the speed at which the satellite is moving around Earth is the exact same speed Earth rotates around its own axis.
So for test and exam, the only thing you need to know is a parsec is 3.2 light years. So I think we are now almost at 22.4, so we can restart a class. So for the next set of lecture slides, we are going to talk about light and telescopes, and that is chapter five. So what is light, what is telescopes, how do we observe it? But before we start with that, there's three videos I want to show you. The one is on tides, and the other one is on gravity, and the last one on telescopes. If Shakespeare had been Shakespeare had been an astronomer, he'd have said that there is a tide in the affairs of the universe, and on such a full sea are we now afloat. He would have been right. You might just think of tides as the ocean going in and out every day, but in fact, what astronomers call tides are a subtle but inexorable force that have literally shaped most objects in the universe. And to understand tides, we start with gravity. Gravity is a force and it weakens with distance. An important thing to note is that we measure gravity from the center of mass of an object, not its surface. One way to think of the center of mass of an object is the average position in an object of all its mass. For an evenly distributed sphere, that's its center. Right now, unless you're an astronaut, you're about 6,400 kilometers from the center of the Earth. If you stand up, your head is a couple of meters farther away from the Earth's center than your feet. Since gravity weakens with distance, the force of Earth's gravity on your head is an eensy weensy bit less than it is on your feet. How much less? A mere 0.00005%. And that's way too small for you ever to notice. But what if you were taller? Well, the taller you are, the farther your head is from the Earth's center and the weaker force it will feel. If you were, say, about 300 kilometers tall, the force of gravity would drop by about 10% at your head. That probably would be enough to notice if you weren't dying from asphyxiation and, you know, being 300 kilometers tall. This change in the force of gravity over distance is what astronomers call the tidal force. When you have a massive object affecting another object with its gravity, its tidal force depends on several factors. For one thing, it depends on how strong the gravity is from the first object. The stronger the force of gravity, the stronger the tidal force will be on the affected object. It also depends on how wide the affected object is. The wider it is, the more the force of gravity from the first object changes across it, and the bigger the tidal force. Finally, it depends on how far the affected object is from the first object. The farther away the affected object is, the lower the tidal force will be. Tides depend on gravity, and if gravity is weaker, so is the tidal force. The overall effect of the tidal force is to stretch an object. You're applying a stronger force on one end than you are on the other. So you're pulling harder on one end. That'll stretch it. And this is where tidal forces become very important. Look at the moon. It has gravity, but much less than the Earth because it's less massive. It's 380,000 kilometers away. So the gravitational force it has on you is pretty small. And you're pretty small compared to that distance, just a couple of meters long from head to feet. But the Earth is big. It's nearly 13,000 kilometers across. That means the side of the Earth facing the moon is about 13,000 kilometers closer to the moon than the other side of the Earth. This is a pretty big distance, enough for tides to become important. The side of the Earth facing the moon is pulled harder by the moon than the other side of the Earth, so the Earth stretches. It becomes ever so slightly football-shaped, like a sphere with two bulges, one pointing toward the moon and one pointing away. This is probably the weirdest thing about tidal forces. You might expect only one bulge on the side of the Earth facing the moon. But remember, we measure gravity from the centers of objects. The side of the Earth facing the moon feels a stronger pull toward the moon than the Earth's center, so it's pulled away from the center. But the side facing away from the moon feels a weaker force toward the moon than the Earth's center. This means the center of the Earth is being pulled away from the far side. This is exactly the same as if the far side is being pulled away from the center. And that's why you get two bulges on opposite sides of the Earth. The tidal force is there strongest on the sides of the Earth facing toward and away from the moon, and weakest halfway in between them on each side. A lot of the Earth is covered in water, and water responds to this changing force, this stretching. The water bulges up where the tidal force is strongest on opposite sides of the Earth. If there's a beach on one of those spots, the water will cover it 
we say it's high tide. If a beach is where the tidal force is low, the water's been pulled away from it and it's low tide. But wait a second, the earth is spinning. If you're on a part of the earth facing the moon, you're at high tide. Six hours later, a quarter of a day, the earth's rotation has swept you around to the spot where it's low tide. Six hours after that, you're at high tide again. And then another six hours later, you're at low tide for the second time that day. Finally, a day after you started, you're back at high tide once more. And that's why we have two high tides and two low tides every day. Very generally speaking, the ocean tide causes the sea level to rise and fall by a meter or two every day. Incidentally, the solid earth can bulge as well. It's not as fluid as water, but it can move. The tidal force stretches the solid earth by about 30 centimeters. If you just sit in your house all day, you move up and down by about that much, twice. Like the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all surfaces. The earth's spin has another effect. Lag in the water flow means the water can't respond instantly to the tidal force from the moon. The Earth's spin actually sweeps the bulges forward a bit along the Earth. So picture this. The bulge nearest the moon is actually a bit ahead of the Earth-Moon line. That bulge has mass. Not a lot. Some. Since it has mass, it has gravity, and that pulls on the moon. It pulls the moon forward in its orbit a bit, like pulling on a dog's leash, accelerating it. The moon responds to this tug by going into a higher orbit, the moon is actually moving away from the Earth. The rate of recession of the moon has been measured, and it's something like a few centimeters per year, roughly the same speed your fingernails grow. Now get this, the moon has gravity. Just as the bulge is pulling the moon ahead, the moon is pulling the bulge back, slowing it down. Because of friction with the rest of the Earth, this slowing of the bulge is actually slowing the rotation of the Earth itself, making the day longer. The effect is small, but again, it's measurable. Okay, let's get a little change of perspective. Everything I've said about the moon's tidal effect on the Earth works the other way too. The moon feels tides from the Earth, and they're pretty strong because the Earth is more massive and has more gravity than the moon. Just like Earth, there are two tidal bulges on the moon, one facing the Earth and one facing away. Long ago, the moon was closer to the Earth and spinning rapidly. The moon's tidal bulges didn't align with the Earth, and the Earth's gravity tugged on them, slowing the moon's spin and moving it farther away. As it moved farther away, the time it took to orbit once around the Earth increased. Its orbital period got longer. Eventually, the lengthening rotation of the moon matched how long it took to go around the Earth. When that happened, the axis of the bulges pointed right at the Earth. That's why the moon only shows one face to us. It spins once per month and goes around us once per month. If it didn't spin at all over that month, we'd see the entire lunar surface. But since it does spin once per orbit, we only ever see one face. This is called tidal locking, and it's worked on nearly every big moon in the solar system. Tides from their home planet have matched their spin and orbital period. These moons all show the same face toward their planet. Now, wait a second. If the moon has gravity, which causes tides, and is the root cause behind all these shenanigans, what about the sun? It's even bigger than the moon. Tides depend on the gravity from an object and your distance from it. The sun is far more massive than the moon, but much farther away. These two effects largely cancel each other out. And when you do the math, you find the sun's tidal force on the Earth is just about half that of the moon's. The way the sun's tidal force and the moon's tidal force interact on Earth depends on their geometry, which changes as the moon orbits us. At new moon, the Earth, moon, and sun are in a line. The moon's tidal force aligns with the sun's, reinforcing it. This means we get an extra high, high tide and an extra low, low tide on Earth. We call this the spring tide. When the moon is at first quarter, the tidal bulge from the moon is 90 degrees around from the sun's. High tide from the moon overlaps low tide from the sun. We get a slightly lower high tide and a slightly higher low tide. We call those neap tides. The pattern repeats when the moon is full. The moon, earth, and sun fall along a line again, and we get spring tides. A week later, the moon is moved around, and we get neap tides again. Not only that, the moon orbits the earth on an ellipse. When it's closest to us, we feel a stronger effect. If that also happens at new or full moon, we get an added kick to the spring tides. This is called the proxygian tide and can lead to flooding in low-lying areas. Unless you live on the coast, I bet you had no idea tides were so complex. Tides are universal. They work wherever there's gravity. If two stars orbit each other, each raises a tide in the other. Just like the Earth and Moon, that can slow their spin and increase their separation. Many planets orbiting other stars may be tidally locked to those stars. Near a black hole where the gravity is incredibly intense, the tides are so strong they would pull you like taffy into a long, thin string. Astronomers call this effect spaghettification. No, seriously, that's what we call it. Today you learn that tides are due to the change
Does that explain tides a little bit better? Okay, cool. So let me show you now our second video on gravity. We live, and stop me if I'm going too fast, on a planet. I mean, sure, duh. But this isn't the natural state of the universe, or at least it's not the way things usually are. Most of the universe is pretty empty. That's why we call it space. And if I were to magically transport you someplace randomly in the cosmos, the chances are you'd be a million light years from the nearest substantial object. Evolving on a planet has warped our sense of physics. If I throw an object away from me, it comes back. That's bizarre. Keep going, moving away from me at a constant speed. Instead, though, it goes up, slows, stops, then falls back down toward me. The difference between living on a planet and being in deep space is gravity. Gravity from an object goes on forever, but it gets weaker rapidly with distance. A zillion light years away, the Earth's gravity is fantastically weak, but here on Earth, it's literally a force to be reckoned with. And in some places, it can be a lot stronger than what we experience right here. For most of history, Gravity was just a fact of life, neither understood nor examined terribly closely. In the mid-1600s, scientists like Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton started investigating it using math. In fact, the two men got into a bitter feud over who thought of what first. But whoever it was who first got it right, now we have a much better understanding of how gravity works. But one thing before we get to gravity, an important concept that comes up a lot is mass. It's a bit tricky to define, but you can think of it as how much stuff makes up an object. I know that's not very scientific sounding, but it's not a bad way to think about it. Something with more mass has more stuff in it. Size doesn't really play into this. Two objects can have the same mass, but one can be much larger than the other. In that case, the bigger object's mass is more spread out. So we say it has lower density, where density is how much mass is inside a given volume. In science terms, mass tells us how much an object resists having its motion changed. An object with more mass is harder to get moving than an object with less mass, which is pretty obvious if you've ever tried pushing on a toy truck versus a real truck. But mass is also defined using gravity. Everything that has mass also has gravity and can inflict this force on another object. The amount of force you feel from the gravity of an object, like a planet, depends on three things how much mass it has, how much mass you have, and how far away you are. In fact, distance dominates here. The force of gravity weakens with the square of the distance. Double your distance from an object and the force of gravity drops by two times two equals four times. Go 10 times farther away and the force drops by 10 times 10 equals 100 times. Gravity is also attractive. It can only draw things in, not repel them. But how it attracts things is where it gets fun. If I hold up a rock and let go of it, it falls to the ground. What might be hard to see is that it gets faster the longer it drops. Forces accelerate objects, so the longer the force acts, the more the object's velocity changes, in this case, getting faster. If I drop a rock from higher up, it'll move faster when it hits the ground. Other forces act on moving objects as well, like friction and air resistance, counteracting gravity, making this acceleration hard to see. But in space, the force of gravity becomes very clear. Two objects that have mass will attract each other. If there are no other forces acting on them, they'll accelerate toward each other until they meet. Remember, though, that the force of gravity depends on those masses. If one is really massive and the other not so much, then in more practical terms, the massive one will pull in the less massive one. The more massive one does move, but much less than the other one. When objects are free to move under the effects of gravity, we say they are in orbit. The simplest kind of orbit may not be what you think. It's actually just line. When you drop a rock, it's very briefly in orbit. Ignoring things like the Earth's rotation, which adds a bit of sideways motion, it's close enough to say the rock just falls straight down and is stopped because the Earth itself gets in the way. That's not a terribly interesting orbit. So what if, instead of dropping the rock, we throw it? That gives it a little bit of sideways motion. So instead of hitting the ground at my feet, it hits a bit farther away. If I throw it harder, it moves horizontally even more before it hits. What if I throw it really hard? This is where Newton's genius comes in. He realized that if you throw the ball hard enough sideways, it will fall at the exact same rate the Earth would curve away underneath it. As Douglas Adams said in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, flying is just falling and missing the ground. It turns out that's exactly what orbiting is, too. A rock thrown hard enough sideways will fall toward the Earth, but always miss it 
going instead into a circular path around it, guided only by gravity. It'll orbit the Earth in a circle, taking about 90 minutes to go around the planet once. Circles are simple orbits. The speed at which the orbiting satellite travels depends on the mass of the object it's orbiting and its distance from it. The farther it is, the weaker gravity is, so it doesn't have to travel as quickly to maintain the orbit. Roughly 400 years ago, the astronomer Johannes Kepler realized that there can be other shapes of orbits as well. He discovered the planets orbit the sun on ellipses, when previously it was thought they orbited in perfect circles. An elliptical orbit happens when you throw the rock sideways even harder than it takes for a circular orbit. It goes up higher on one orbit than on the other. In fact, the harder you throw the rock, the more elongated the orbit gets. An orbit like this is still closed. That is, the orbit repeats itself and the rock is still bound to the Earth by gravity. At some point, though, if you throw the rock hard enough, an amazing thing happens. It can escape. Remember, gravity gets weaker with distance. If you throw a rock hard enough, while gravity can slow it down, the gravity gets weaker the farther away the rock is. If the rock has enough velocity, gravity weakens too quickly to stop it. The rock can escape, moving away forever. So we call this the escape velocity. The escape velocity of an object, like a planet or star, depends on how much mass it has and how big it is. For the Earth, that turns out to be about 11 kilometers per second. For Jupiter, it's about 58 kilometers per second. And for the sun, it's about 600 kilometers per second. Whatever the particular escape velocity for your cosmic location is, if you fling a rock away from it faster than that, I hope you kissed it goodbye first, because it ain't coming back. One way to think of it is that the rock is always slowing, getting ever closer to stopping, but it never actually stops. If it could travel infinitely far away, it would stop, but that's kind of a long trip. This works in reverse, too. If I go way far away from the Earth and drop a rock, it'll accelerate. When it hits the planet, it'll be moving at escape velocity, that same 11 kilometers per second. And if I give it a little sideways kick, it'll miss the Earth, but still pass us at escape velocity. An escape orbit is open. It doesn't come back and is shaped like a parabola. What if you throw the rock even harder than that? The rock doesn't come back and moves away even faster. The orbit is now a hyperbola, which is similar to a parabola, but is even more open. The rock never stops, even at infinity. It just keeps moving up. Like all forces, gravity gets weaker with distance, but its force never quite drops to zero. It just gets smaller and smaller as you get farther and farther away. So why then are astronauts on the space station? Gravity is still pulling on the astronauts. In fact, at the height of the station, Earth's gravity has only decreased by a little bit. It's still about 90% as strong as it is on the Earth's surface. If they were in a tower 320 kilometers high, they'd weigh 90% of what they do on the Earth's surface. But the big difference is that the astronauts are in orbit, falling around the Earth. Weight is actually not just the force of gravity on mass, but how hard a surface pushes back on that mass. For example, when you stand on the ground, the ground pushes back. Otherwise, you'd fall through. The force of the ground back on you is what causes you to have weight. In free fall, there's nothing pushing back. You're falling freely, and so you have no weight. NASA likes to call this condition microgravity, since there are subtle forces acting on you. This actually highlights the difference between mass and weight. In space, you have the same mass as you do on Earth, but no weight. If another astronaut pushed on you, they'd have to exert a force. But if you stood on a scale in space, it wouldn't register anything. Space is weird. Well, compared to Earth. One more thing, and this is truly weird. Photons, particles of light, have no mass, yet they can be affected by gravity too, bending their direction of flight as they pass a massive object. It turns out gravity can actually warp space. Light travels along the fabric of space like a truck on the road, and if the road curves, so does the truck. I know this is an odd concept, and we'll be dealing with it later in more detail when we push escape velocity to its limits with black holes. Today you learned that gravity Does that explain orbits and escape velocity a bit better? Now there's one more video I want to show you guys, and that is what our next set of lecture slides is going to be about. I've talked a lot about observing the night sky with your eyes, just simply going out and seeing what you can see. It's pretty amazing what you can learn by doing that, and of course, that's all we humans could do. Thousands of years. But now we 
lost to history. Despite common knowledge, Galileo did not invent them. He wasn't even the first person to point one at the sky or the first person to publish results, but he was a loud and persistent voice over the years, and his amazing string of discoveries using his crude instrument landed him firmly in the history books. Aggressive self-marketing sometimes pays off. You might think the purpose of a telescope is to magnify small objects so we can see them better. That's how a lot of telescopes are marketed, but to be honest, that's not exactly the case. If you want to be really general, the purpose of a telescope is to make things easier to see, to make the invisible visible, and to make the things already visible visible more clearly. A telescope works by gathering light. Think of it like a bucket in the rain. The bigger the bucket, the more rain you collect. If your bucket is big enough, you'll get plenty of water even when it's only sprinkling it. In the case of a telescope, the bucket is an optical device like a lens or a mirror that collects light. We call this device the objective, and the bigger the objective, the more light it collects. Look at your eyes. Well, that's tough, so let's think about our eyes for a moment. They also work as light buckets, but they only collect light through our pupils, which even under the best of circumstances are less than a centimeter across, a very tiny bucket indeed. But we can do better. To extend the analogy, a telescope is like a bucket with a funnel at the bottom. All that light that it collects is then concentrated, focused, and sent into your eye. It turns a trickle of light into a torrent. The amount of light it collects depends on the area of the objective. That means if you double the diameter of the collector, you'd collect four times as much light because the area of the collector goes up as the square of the radius. Make a bucket 10 times wider and you collect 100 times as much light. Clearly, as telescopes get bigger, their ability to show us faint objects increases enormously. In fact, that was one of Galileo's first and most important discoveries. Stars that were invisible to the naked eye were easily seen through his telescope, even though it only had a lens a few centimeters across. Those faint stars didn't emit enough light for his eyes to see them, but when he increased his collecting area with a telescope, they popped into visibility. The primary way telescopes work is to change the direction light from an object is traveling. I can see a star with my eye because light from that star is sent in my direction, into my eye. But most of that light misses my eye, falling to the ground all around me. The telescope collects that light, bounces it around, and then channels it into my eye. When the very first telescopes were built, this changing of the direction of light was done using lenses. When light goes from one medium to another, say from going through air to going through water or glass, it changes direction slightly. You see this all the time. A spoon sitting in a glass of water looks bent or broken. The spoon is doing just fine, but the light you see from it is getting bent, distorting the image. This bending is called refraction. The way light bends depends on what's bending it, like water or glass, and the shape of the object doing the bending. It so happens that if you grind a piece of glass into a lens shape, it bends or refracts the incoming light in a cone, focusing it into a single spot. It's a light funnel. This refraction has a couple of interesting results. For one thing, the light from the top of a distant object is bent down and the light from the bottom is bent up. When this light comes to a focus, it means you see the object upside down. It also flips left and right, which can be a little disconcerting and takes getting used to when you're using a refracting telescope. For another thing, the lens can magnify the image. That's again because the light is bent and the image created of an observed object can appear larger than the object does by eye. It depends on a lot of factors, including the shape of the lens, the distance to the object, and how far away the lens is. But in the end, what you get is an image that looks bigger. That has obvious advantages. A planet like Jupiter is too far away to see anything other than a dot to the eye. But a tele And details can then be seen. When Galileo and other early astronomers pointed their telescopes at the sky, multitudes were revealed. Craters on the moon, the phases of Venus, Jupiter's moons, the rings of Saturn, and so much more. The universe itself came into focus. When astronomers talk about using a telescope to make details more clear, they use a term called resolution. This is the ability to separate two objects that are very close together. You're familiar with this. When you're driving on a road at night, a distant car coming toward you appears as a single light. When it gets closer, the light separates out, resolves into two headlights. A telescope increases resolution, making it easier to, say, split two stars that are close together, or to see details on the moon's surface. The resolution depends in part on the size of the objective. In general, the bigger the telescope objective, the better your resolution is. Resolution is more useful than magnification when talking telescopes. Fundamentally, there's a limit to how well your telescope resolves two objects, but there's no limit to how much you can magnify the image. 
If you magnify the image beyond what the telescope can actually resolve, you just get mush. Refracting telescopes are great, but they suffer from a big problem. Big lenses are hard to make. They get thin near the edge and break easily. Also, different colors of light bend by different amounts as they pass through the lens. So you might focus a red star, say, and a blue one will still look fuzzy. No less a mind than Isaac Newton figured a way around this. Use mirrors. Mirrors also change the direction light travels. And if you used a curved mirror, you can also bring light rays to a focus. Telescopes that use mirrors are called reflectors. The advantages of reflectors are huge. You only have to polish one side of a mirror, where a lens has two sides. Also, a mirror can be supported along its back, so they can be manufactured much larger, more easily, and for less money. Although there have been many improvements made over the centuries, most big modern telescopes at their heart are based on the Newtonian design. And in fact, no large professional grade telescopes made today have a lens as their objective. Nowadays, it's all done with mirrors. And that brings us to this week's aptly named Focus On. The most common question I'm asked besides, hey, who does your hair, is, hey, Phil, what kind of telescope should I buy? It's a legitimate question, but it's very difficult to answer. Imagine someone walked up to you and asked, what kind of car should I buy? That's impossible to answer without a lot more information. Same for telescopes. Do you want to look at the moon and planets or fainter, more difficult to spot galaxies? Are you really devoted to this or is it more of a pastime? Is this for a child or an adult? These questions are critical. Most small scopes are refractors, which are good for looking at detail on the moon and planets. They tend to magnify the image more than reflectors do, but they're tricky to use because they flip the image left and right and up and down. Bigger scopes are good for fainter objects, but are more expensive and can be difficult to set up and use. I hate hearing about a scope that just collects dust because it was bought in haste. So here's what I recommend. Find an observatory, planetarium, or a local astronomy club. They're likely to have star parties, public observing events, where you can look at and through different kinds of telescopes. Their owners are almost universally thrilled to talk about them. As an astronomer, I can assure you that the problem with astronomers isn't getting them to talk, it's shutting them up. So you'll get lots of great first-hand advice and experience. Also, I usually recommend getting binoculars before a telescope. They're easy to use, fun to use, easy to carry around, and you can get good ones for less money and still see some nice things. Even if you decide not to get more into astronomy as a hobby, they can also be used during the day on hikes and for bird watching. I have a couple of pair of binoculars and I use them all the time. There's a third aspect to telescopes that's very important. Beyond resolution and making faint things easier to see, they can literally show us objects outside of the range of colors our eyes can see. In the year 1800, William Herschel discovered infrared light, a kind of light invisible to our eyes. In the time since, we've learned of other forms of invisible light, radio, microwave, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Astronomical objects can be observed in all these flavors of light if we have telescopes that are designed to detect these flavors of light. Radio waves pass right around normal telescopes, ones that we use to observe visible light. X-rays and gamma rays pass right through them as if they aren't even there. But we're smart, we humans. We learned that giant metal dishes can and will bend radio waves and can be formed just like gigantic Newtonian mirrored telescopes. In fact, different forms of light need different kinds of telescopes. And once we figured out how, we built them. We can now detect cosmic phenomena across the entire spectrum of light from radio waves to gamma rays, and have even built unconventional telescopes that detect subatomic particles from space as well, such as neutrinos and cosmic rays. Because of this, we've learned far more about the universe than Galileo could have imagined. And we're in the midst of another revolution too. The actual biophysics is complicated, but in a sense, our eyes act like movie cameras, taking pictures at a frame rate of about 14 images per second. That's a short amount of time. Photographs, though, can take far longer exposures, allowing the light to build up allowing us to see much fainter objects. The first photographs taken through a telescope were done in the 1800s. This has led to innumerable discoveries. For example, in the 20th century, giant telescopes with giant cameras revealed details in distant galaxies that led to our understanding that the universe is expanding, a critically important concept that we'll dive into later in the series. And now we have digital detectors, similar to the ones in your phone camera, but far larger and far more sensitive. They can be dozens of times more light sensitive than film, able to detect in minutes objects that would have taken hours or more to see using film. These digital cameras can also be designed to detect ultraviolet light, infrared, and more. We can store vast amounts of that data easily on computers and use those computers to analyze that huge ocean of information, performing tasks too tedious for humans. Most asteroids and comets are discovered using autonomous software, for example, looking for moving objects among the tens or hundreds of thousands of fixed stars in digital images. This has also ushered in the era of remote astronomy, 
A telescope can be on a distant mountain and programmed to scan the sky automatically. It also means we can loft telescopes into space above the sea of air in our atmosphere that blurs and distorts distant faint objects. We can visit other worlds and send the pictures and data back home or put observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit around the Earth and have it peer into the vast depths of the universe. I would argue that the past century has seen a revolution in astronomy every bit as important as the invention of the telescope in the first place. In the early 17th century, the entire sky was new, and everywhere you pointed a telescope, there was some treasure to behold. But with our huge telescopes and incredibly sensitive digital eyes now, that's still true. We learn more about the universe every day just as we learn that there's more to learn every day too. That's one of the best parts of being an astronomer. The universe is like a jigsaw puzzle with an infinite number of pieces. The fun never ends. And remember, even with all the wonders revealed by telescopes, your eyes are still pretty good instruments too. You don't need big fancy equipment to see the sky. The important thing is to go outside. Look up, that's fun too. Today you learn that telescopes do two things. Okay, so so I have a question. When we return to face-to-face -face classes, will it be possible if you turn on your mic and just record your screen as you are presenting to the class? I'm assuming you will be using lecture slides on your computer and then upload that recording to ClickUp. Yes, I can do that as well. And as you will see on ClickUp, I have posted a link to previous year's lecture recordings as well that you can use. So if I've made uh, lecture recordings during the COVID years. On ClickUp, I've pasted the link to those videos and you're more welcome to use them if that will help you. Thank you. It's very helpful to be able to access those recordings later. Yes, you are more than welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you have any other questions? So, our class now is ending in format. So, I think let's call a day. Then I'll see you all online next week. Otherwise, have a great afternoon, great evening, and I see you. We'll see you all tomorrow.